bit of fun trying to share this stuff and get it out there and I, d- I don't want to be too redundant and be pushing the same thing all like just down people's throats until they're sick of it i i want it to be you know something that people enjoy and and it introduces something new and um and hopefully i mean my goal is obviously just to be seen that's what the games are about right so, so yes. that's that's my ultimate goal with it but um i'm trying things that i just haven't tried before or that maybe haven't been necessarily so appealing to me in the past or i guess i'm maybe trying to get out of myself and my past habits and routines of of releasing music and i'm not trying to be too traditional but i am trying to maximize my own exposure i guess and and at this point yes it's going to come out soon i'm doing pre-sales for the first time i've never had the chance to do that um so I think 10 days, I, I just did the distribution deal tonight after I got the album cover uploaded and everything. So um, 10 days, I should have a link for pre-sales. So what I'm I'm thinking is, you know, we'll have some sort of, of free items or something for pre-sales. There's two tracks. The two tracks that we've listened to will come as uh, the, the instant gratification tracks, they call them, instant grat tracks, whatever. So you'll get those right away. Um, and then, uh, the actual release date, I believe I put at September 16th. Okay. Plenty of time to prepare then. They said the more, the better. And I believe them like the, so pre, this is what a pre-sale is like all those sales that you accumulate up until the day of your actual release count towards your sales that day. Yeah. So I, I'm just learning this. Like, I guess I didn't know that, that they had something that cool available for artists like me. So so then once you kick off the pre-sale, are you going to do any kind of like little concert string, drum up attention for it? Um, I don't plan on doing any live performances this year. Okay. Um, I've, I've, this, this entire year I've spent planning, preparing, writing, recording. Of course. But mostly it's, it's trying to put together a real business plan and following it like i and that takes a lot of preparation especially when there's really no actual guarantees i mean i can ask for guarantees when i book a show but that doesn't mean that when i get there i'm gonna really get it you know like i've mm-hmm. i, I oh, just yeah. I, I gotta be real you oh. know like there's just a lot of things that happen and by the time, you know, from, you know, if you book something, say, three months out, by the time it gets here, some I've showed up and they've got another band playing on the stage, you know? I mean, you just, you really never know what you're going to walk into. Yeah, we've done that before, too, booked a show. We booked a double night at the Red Sea, because we always used to do that and put as many acts on as possible, just pack it in. And we showed up, I, I think it was one of the last ones we did, and they had not taken note that it was a double, and they had a whole, like, a reggae show booked, that screwed a whole lot of stuff up. Right. <laughs> you know, and I, Pacey, I'm really glad that you just said that because that was something else I did kind of want to talk about just real quick is the the show structures and the way that things have been done. So I guess you would call it traditionally now where you sign 10 bands to come play on the night mm-hmm. and try to get them to bring 10 people so there's at least 100 people in the crowd. Well, that never happens. No, and the problem is you the more artists you have on the bill, the less they think they have to do to promote it. Exactly. Yes. And not only that, but then you get the guys who have no respect for anybody on the bill anyway mm. and show up and either get too drunk to perform or they show up late and want a later set time and get mad when you tell them no or... You show get, up, leave, do their set, leave. That's the worst one. Yep. The ones that do their show, and they do actually maybe bring, say, five to ten people. Mm. And then as soon as they're done on the stage, if you know nobody's like on their merch table, because obviously they want to make money, hopefully, if they, if they have merch or albums or anything for sale, then... You know, they they sneak out the back while the next band is up on, or the next artist is on stage, and then their fans leave and they go kick it somewhere else and party down the road at the the you know whatever other bar is down there. And to me, that's the most disrespectful thing that you can really do. Like I, I've booked yeah. a lot of shows and I've had it happen a lot of times, and I won't book those people again. Like, mm. and that might not be a big deal to them. You know, it might not be a, that's that's the way might we, not we even be a consequence shows. you know there was, there was like a, a list of things like if you if you left after your set obviously you weren't getting paid and we probably weren't going to book you again if your people started fights 
we're done. Right. That's not the environment we want to put on with our concerts. Like they're, they're, we had an extensive list, and and there was it, people who didn't show up for the set on time. And <sighs> well, here was what I was getting at. I don't want to do that shit anymore. Right. <laughs> no, I think I, I actually have been thinking about that a lot more too. And and because I look at things outside of the the hip hop scene, and I'm looking at all these bands, and when when it's bands doing stuff, they're they're there. They got maybe two three sets in a night, one band, or there's three bands, two bands on the bill, and right. That's the show. That's that's what it should you know, be artist focused. I'm energy. interested in finding quality artists who are interested enough in investing in their own shows and and having enough time to do what they want to do with their time. And and actually for my stuff, me personally, like I, I just want maybe one, sometimes two guys with with projects. You know, with something to push, with a new album, a new single, a new, even if it's a new freaking shirt, just something mm-hmm. that they're there for. Because I feel like a lot of times these these artists and all, uh, fine, you can be an artist, but please, as an artist, have a reason to be there. Mm-hmm. Don't just be there so you can be on stage and sing a song that you think is cool and you're never going to release. And nobody's like there. You're wasting everybody's time. That's not an industry artist. If that's all you're there for, like, turn on your Facebook Live and let your friends watch you. Right. Seriously, like, you'll probably have more people at that show. There's, eh? there's, yes, more people will watch <laughs> and and care. Yeah. I mean, it just it. There's, I think there's a feeling and a vibe that has left a lot of these local shows. It's the rap game. It's not the rap business, and that's what a lot of people fall, where it falls for a lot of people. I think. I think that man, this stuff's just been going on for so long, though. Like I, I, I get that people are bored and also grown. So, like, I think that we just need to kind of switch the mindset a little bit and actually be who. Like, God, it's, it's it's hard to explain. So. I don't know, man. I feel like everybody got bored and just decided that being online was better than actually talking to humans and yeah, and, and yeah. shaking their hands. And I disagree with that. Like, I think that there's just so much of a focus on what is digitally available that everybody thinks that that's more of a of a, of a valued investment of their time. And I'm just I'm going to 100 percent disagree at this point because it's so saturated that I don't think any of us are getting looked at online. Really? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, as far as what we're really shooting for, like it, it's we need human interaction. Mm-hmm. And I'm not even talking about like the other rappers. I'm talking about like fans. Yeah. You yep. know, like we, we need fans, man. More, 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 more musicians need to get out and actually. Like, I've performed flyers. for more rappers over the <laughs> over the years than any Those other species of human being. <laughs> and it's just, you know, and I none of them come to the front of the stage. They all hang around near the edge. You know, that they're the only ones there. It's it's kind of interesting to watch people, man, because I get to see shows that that have very few people where everybody feels watched. And then I get to go and do shows with with Tech Nine where everybody's a group of people and enjoying the show and have probably seen Tech Nine 10 or 15 freaking times. Yeah. You know, like which is is great for him and it's great for music and it's great for independent artists and it's great for hip hop because he's successful. Mm. And and right now all the little underground guys that come up want to be just like Tech Nine. Who are you going to get in, uh, compared to no matter who you are in the underground? Tech Nine. It is going to be Tech Nine. He did Nine. it well. He paved that, that, uh, that independent path. He never stopped grinding. Way. And he wasn't even the first one to do it. He just did it loudest. He's Yes, he's made a, a, an impression. Yes. And, and it's, it's been fun for me to watch and to be a fan of that and to be able to work with him. I would love to be able to do Here's my beef some of those things. With a strange, I, I don't want to get you in trouble or anything. I'm sure this podcast won't because it's little and nothing. But my beef, and I've never opened for strange, so I don't know. But from what I have heard is as a Bion artist, you don't have access to any of the stage lights that they use or any kind of thing. You can only get part of the system. Like It doesn't sound as full quality as what... This is this is the complaints I have heard throughout the years opening for people opening for Strange. I've never had that experience. 
Um, I'm I've seen people complaining. I don't know what their experiences were, but every time that I have personally worked with them, I've been responsible for me and everything that went along with my show. I mean, that was the agreement, mm. and they've always. Strange Music has always followed through with what they told me they were going to do when I was part of their projects. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So, yeah, from my, my perspective, they, they are professional and, and do what they say they're going to do. I'm not kissing ass. No, no I mean, I'm just no. saying it's, that's true for me. Right. I, and for other people, that might not be the truth. And I, if that's the case, sorry for them. Right. They no, it's just in that situation. Probably I probably should have handled their point. business better. Like, why, why, why make an artist buy on to a show that's going to sell out anyway, even if they don't sell a ticket? You know what I mean? Granted, I, they should have. It's all about. When yeah. it comes to money, a lot of people feel a lot of ways, mm. especially when they're not getting it. And it's hard as somebody who isn't doing those that level of business to really understand where the money's coming from. And a lot of it is from artists like you or like me or, or who want to be in those spots. But at the same time, those are valuable spots. Yeah. I mean, they are worth money. And if you, if, if I handle my business, right, I can capitalize on that. And I I think if somebody is smart enough to invest that kind of money in that size of a production, then they should probably have their own lights and their own shit, you yeah. know, and not rely on strange music who they're not signed to and who has no financial obligation to them to put on a good show on their behalf. I mean, truthfully. If if it were your record label, would you want to shell out the cash for them to use your million dollar lights, <laughs> or would you save those for your headliner? I mean, we got the wireless mics, and pretty much every show we ever used them with, we let everybody use them. So I I can't am, say which way I'd really I, lean when it. Came I've to let that. a few I mean, people use my mic. I hate letting somebody use my microphone. Like I've used the same mic for twelve years. That's my microphone. Mm. I feel like if you're an artist, you should own a fucking microphone. I've never seen a guitar player or a drummer show up and say, I hope the venue's guitars sound good, or I hope the venue's drums are banging tonight. Like, they're going to come got some sticks. with their own shit. You know what I mean? Like, if you're a vocalist, yeah. own a microphone. Right. Show up with it. Know how it works. Know how it works with you. There's there's no excuse for anything less. I mean, if if it's really what you're doing, invest in it. You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I've i been the beginner, and I invested in myself. So I, I'm not saying things that I haven't done or that I didn't begin at doing. Um, it's, it's important shit, and people notice. They do, and they judge harshly. They really do. It, it's not fake. And when you're standing up there with the beat-up, nasty house mic that, that the cord fucking falls out <laughs> of, and you, you know, you can't hear yourself anymore. And, yeah people judge you yep. so show up with things that you know how they work <laughs> and that are quality and and hopefully you have a good experience you know but yeah strange is good man they are they've been good to me anyway yeah i mean that, I, I don't want to sign to them it had to have been a dream to tour with chris calico it was that, absolutely that had to have been a lot of fun i i don't you know at this point i've done almost everything that i've wanted to do really and truthfully um, there's a venue in Newton, Iowa that I always wanted to play and it's not really even a venue. It's called the Maytag bowl and it's just, it's a great big amphitheater in, in the city where I got in a whole bunch of trouble in as a kid. <laughs> and I just always wanted to play there because I felt like it was super cool and it right. was something that I just wanted to do. And, uh, when I released ugly, I had the album release party there and, yes, and I we did that. that. Yep, yep. So that was a really big deal for me. And then, uh, you know, getting to do that tour with Calico, was probably the biggest production that I've ever really gotten to be a part of aside from um, when Slipknot was headlining Rockstar and they had me out there doing a sideshow. But um, I was never advertised or promoted on any of that stuff. I was actually promoted on the Strange Tour. So to me, that was the biggest thing. 
And I've personally, in my career, had a lot of issues with that shit. And it pisses me the fuck off, dude, because I've paid a lot of money to be on different tours at different times. And often they just leave me off the fly. 